the touch points to consumers that will then lead to positive engagement, positive profitable revenue, long-term relationship building, all of that are mediated through so many different things, through customer service, through sales, through marketing, through social media, etc. that you could understand the desire of a CEO to say, look, we've got to coordinate all of that. You know, we've got to bring that together. Someone needs to orchestrate that. Someone needs to think that through more holistically. And, and, and that someone should have a sort of very clear eye at the end of the day on growth. And so I think that's, that's what has started to happen where you see collapsing, you know, first you saw collapsing of CMO and CCOs, was more around the communications function. Then you saw, you know, collapsing of revenue and, and marketing or sales and marketing. Uh, and then you sometimes see sort of strategy revenue marketing all kind of coming together. A number of major brands have adjusted their approach to marketing leadership, but does this spell doom for the role of CMO? Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Jeremy Bergeron. Our guest today is Michael Diamond. He is the academic director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department at NYU School of Professional Studies, where he serves as Clinical Assistant Professor of Integrated Marketing. Michael brings to the table an extensive marketing, PR, and communications background, including a combined 19 years at Time Warner Inc. and Time Warner Cable. Tune in to hear his take on whether the chief marketing role is going away or just simply evolving. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce and the CMO Club. The CMO Club is a global community for senior marketing executives to come together, share ideas, and solve their toughest challenges in a collaborative and trusted environment with other marketing leaders. Salesforce and the CMO Club provide best-in-class programs, events, and a digital platform for marketing leaders to come together and be inspired like never before. Join our global community at thecmoclub.com. You are the first marketing leader that I've connected with in the past year and a half that is currently teaching uh, marketing and comms and comes from your background. So, so I'm delighted to just get into all the things that I've kind of been hearing from a lot of CMOs across industries in the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000. So as we share and, and connect today, imagine that your classroom is now filled with CMOs uh, within the Fortune 1 and 500 and 1000. And so i um, excited to draw on your experience and perspective there. Um, just starting kind of at the top of marketing and PR, really, which are two things that I know you you dance in quite often in teaching and, and practicing. Um, and I, something about the transformation of marketing and PR, this need for a new curriculum, right, for these emerging professionals. The CMO is such an interesting role, especially in 2022. The modern day marketing leader is such an interesting person on the executive leadership team. And so much is changing, as you know. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on just, yeah, this the, the marketing and PR world. What's this transformation you speak of and, and what are you seeing in the spaces? What we've identified is, uh, you know, several really important trends that seem to be redefining uh, the role of the chief marketing or the chief communications leader. And, you know, there are some who would argue, um, you know, the role uh, of, of marketing and PR is the same. Um, you know, perhaps the tools have changed or perhaps the context has changed. But I think some of the shifts that we've observed are radical enough that they require us all as professionals to think about, you know, how we do our jobs and, and most importantly, how we have impact. And from my perspective, obviously, I'm interested in the piece that's about how can I support a professional's development in learning and training and, you know, research or thinking about this role. So so the, the ones we've identified as, I think, very, really critical is, is one is about globalization. Yes. Um, and and what, I, what I mean by that is that um, it's really about the fact that we always thought about um, – global markets, international markets, as certainly US Western companies, as places where we could sell more product. You know, this is a chance to get our product out into markets outside the US or markets outside the home market. You know, as people became more sophisticated, uh, they thought about, you know, how do we localize our product? How do we 
become more culturally and uh, you know locally relevant and then they moved into the worlds of even you know purchasing local brands and seeing if they could bring them into their infrastructure but i think that that notion of globalization is is shifting continues to shift and 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 i i talk about it in the context of of the importance of influence and innovation yes yeah? so or the globalization of influence and inf innovation what i mean by influence what i mean by influence is that you know what you do in, uh, you know, southern China and how you treat your workers there or, you know, where you supply product, you know, source products and can have an enormous impact on people's perceptions of you as a brand, um, you know, even in your home market or or more positive spin, you know, the the role of influencers in social media, et cetera, has a whole different um, sort of value uh, in, in a market like China or India uh, than it might have in the US. And so, you know, there are global forces shaping how people perceive your brand. The second thing is that a ton of innovation, you know, and it seems silly almost to say it because it's self-evidently true. A ton of innovation is happening outside of the home market, you know, and I think a lot of global marketers or, or marketers, you know, who work for large multinational companies, you know, have to get their heads around the fact that not everything happens at the home office, not all innovation happens at the home office. And, and, you know, like any good marketer being very sensitive to customers needs and customers uses and things like that will, will, will enable you to source innovation globally. Um, so that that's a piece we talk about is globalization. Um, I mean, the second thing we talk about, uh, again, it's it's well understood now, but is having a continual and deep uh, impact on the role of, of CMOs and CCOs is, is the whole field of data uh, and technology, uh, you know, digital digital data technology, however you want to characterize it. I think we've all seen that the power of uh, data to give us new insights and, and to, to provide um, a kind of uh, a whole new sort of quantitative, but in some sense, qualitative view of, of the customer. And, and we're working to figure out how to leverage that. Um, but also the increasing automa automation of, of marketing technology, you know, CMOs typically, or I think one survey I say, saw are spending more than the CIO on technology in some companies. Wow. You know? so, so technology, uh, MarTech, AdTech, ComTech, whatever p piece of the puzzle it is, you know, that's obviously, uh, it's not a new thing for CMOs. We've had CRM, we've had all sorts of other things, but it's integral part of how we do our jobs is, is, is arguably more important. Um, I think one that I find fascinating and is, you know, a very significant shift, um, which we saw illustrated in Cannes uh, this, this, this year, I, and I'll give some examples, is this whole idea of uh, reputation and trust. So as marketers, you could argue we've always been at some level concerned with building brands. But I think what's also shifted significantly in the business world is th that people look no longer to the, you know, to the to government and politics and journalism and the church or whatever as a source of sort of truth and trust. But they're looking to businesses, uh, you know, for profit enterprises to provide some kind of meaning or purpose or at least be a trusted voice uh, uh, in providing information or a trusted partner in getting them food when they're in a lockdown and things like that. You know, the stories from Shanghai, where we're very active, are legion with companies actually taking a much larger role in serving people in that community than the government was able to. So so this, this whole notion of reputation and trust, um, you know, very closely followed by folks like Edelman, you know, in the trust barometer or, or Reuters does some really good work in this space. And, and, and the related shift among consumers from what we sometimes talk about from value, I what's something worth to me to values, I do identify, I do I identify with the, you know, the purpose and mission and, and, and goals broadly of that company. That's very important. And, and we can learn a ton as marketers from the PR folks. And then the next one is this idea of, of the integration of, of marketing and PR, which I think you, you started to allude to a little bit. And, I mean, there's been this sort of friendly, I think I once called it Cain and Abel rivalry between mark and marketing and PR. I started, you know, on the marketing side of that, but I now obviously manage and, and lead and support a, a faculty and, and a large group of students studying PR. So I've come to learn a lot more about, you know, that function and what it adds. But the thing that's clearly true is in this omni-channel environment where you have so many different touch points and so much transparency, you can't really 
any longer say, oh, well, that's the message we put out to the regulators. And, oh, that's what we tell the, you know, uh, the investment community. And this is the story we run with the prayer in the trade press. But then this is the brand marketing we do. You know, all of those things are, are highly integrated and, and need to be coordinated and thought through in a more integrated fashion. So, you know, those at least are, are some of the uh, are some of the more sort of salient large trends uh, that we've started to really, you know, I, I mean, they, you know, they, they, they have meaningful impact in how you do your, your job today, I think, as a marketer. Wow. There were many what I like to call mic drop moments in that in that answer, Michael. Uh, I was jotting down a couple of notes just to circle back on a few things that were really interesting. Um, just maybe drilling in a little bit more on this idea of sourcing innovation and how CMOs can think about this more, yeah, more strategically, certainly brands that are, you know, sizable, multi-billions and responsible for quite a bit of impact. How can they start to think, how can CMOs and marketing leaders start to think about this idea of sourcing innovation uh, creatively and effectively? And have you seen this, maybe give an example or where you're seeing this done or, or how CMOs can maybe take some action there? Yeah. Well, you know, I th I think they're sort of, you know, broadly uh, responding or quickly responding. I think, you know, I almost think about it as terms of a bucket that's around creativity and then a bucket that's around business model and business model design. And, you know, um, I mean, you could say product design as well. But I think the creativity piece is probably sort of easier in a sense. You know, you, uh, many of us just got back from Cannes you know, 22,000, uh, over 22,000 entries to the Cannes Lions, 87 countries, you know, the jury panels are amazingly global, you know, creativity and, and, and the expression of human insight and, and, you know, art and everything is, is a global thing, you know, the, the nobody can possibly sort of see the world uh, anymore through the lens that, you know, great, sort of campaignable ideas might not come from outside the US. And, and, and that I think is probably hopefully self-evident. And, and what's even more clearly true is, you know, if you want to speak to uh, a certain, uh, you know, target market in a country authentically in a culturally relevant way, you need to do that with, with, with folks from that area, et cetera. So there's this sort of idea that um, at a very baseline minimum, we need to, you know, uh, you know, we need to be aware, synthesizing, actively bringing into our conversations, stories and cases and, and examples from outside the, the US. And at NYUSBS, one of the things that we really, um, uh, insist on or, or encourage strongly is uh, the use of, for example, when you're running an advertising, if you're t teaching students about advertising or marketing or something like that, don't just use a case study from, you know, this is not your father's Oldsmobile, you know, there's amazing case studies from India and China and Brazil and Argentina, you know, so that's one aspect, which I think is about, you know, you've got to just be proactively aware uh, and looking beyond, you know, what happened in New York. The, the second, which is around business models, I think that is, you know, that's back to, you, you speak to most of the senior leaders in FMCG, most of them will tell you, you know, when they go to visit um, uh, the office in, in Dubai or the office in Paris, you know, they spend as much time walking around the streets, looking in the shops, talking to customers, you know, looking, you know, you've, you've got to be very actively engaged, I think, with the environment around you. Uh, we have a professor right now, uh, George Benaroya, who's been doing this extraordinary trip to, I, I, I think he was in, in Antarctica, he was in Patagonia, you know, and he's reporting back, you know, what what things uh, cost, what they look like, how they're packaged, you know, what form and shape and size things come in. So, you know, I think it's it's marketers have to be, um, you know, intellectually curious. Uh, Keith Weed said a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's quoted elsewhere having said it, but I, I only heard it in the last you know month or so. He said the role of the CMO at the C-suite level is to bring the outside in and the future forward. And I thought that was really wonderful, especially, you know, for the point of this question, I think the outside in uh, and perhaps the future forward too is what you'll find when you go globally. You know, you'll find 
the market that's never had a good physical distribution system through retailers within 10 miles of each other or something, you know, so they have to find other solutions to problems. You know, we saw that in the early days of uh, mobile telephony and mobile banking and e-commerce and all those kind of things where where the solutions that were derived uh, were ones perhaps out of necessity for a local market, but they became much more attractive broadly. Look at the whole social media ecosystem in China, and you'll find an entirely different way of doing business than we do today. And there are lessons to be learned. You know, uh, Mark Pritchard has said as much, um, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has said as much, you know, that they, clearly you've got to look outside the US. So, so I think marketers just have to be um, constantly curious about the world and, and actively trying to derive insights. You also talked about the this concept of like the CMO oftentimes spending more than, than a CIO and the technology for factor. And just on, on that point, just the connection between the CMO and the CIO, I think this is an interesting one that has become now super relevant today, where maybe in years past, that alignment might not have been as necessary, where today, the CMO and the CIO or CTO, they're, they're talking quite a bit, yep. data yep. and privacy and this and that. And so, what have you noticed when, with with that relationship, you know, uh, the evolution of those two roles and how they can be more tightly integrated, how they can work close together? And maybe if you have an example of, you know, how that's was done well in your perspective or yeah. if you've seen it. You know, there are several different aspects to that. Uh, you know, there are often in companies technologists who are themselves, in essence, uh, the source of product innovation and product design, you know. And so... You know, I know, for example, when I was working at Time Warner Cable, having a really close relationship with the chief technology officer of the company was very important to me as the marketing lead because he and his team were developing all these extraordinary or exploring all these extraordinary applications of, you know, the IP or the cable infrastructure or whatever. And 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 we could very directly help him bring a consumer lens to that activity, you know, so we could help him and his team prioritize what things uh, might make more or less sense for our target customers or explore, you know, how to position those things. And I think as a marketer partnering with any kind of technologist, you want or any innovation group, you want to be in early. You know, you you don't want to be the marketer that gets handed the brief at the end when the whole thing's developed, designed and, you know, in a black box to, and then told market this. You know, you want to be in very early on and you can be in with credibility because you bring again the outside in and the future forward. You bring some of that insight, that consumer insight and understanding and, and some language around positioning and other things. So so I think that's sort of side of technology. And then the other side perhaps you were more closely referencing, which is more like sort of information technology. I think marketers have a long history of working, hopefully, in a productive way with with information technologists around things like, you know, in the old days, things like CRM, um, you know, more database-driven technology, and, and recently around, uh, you know, the web and, and, and uh, you know, more internet-based technologies. And I think we'll work equally closely as we get into Web 3.0 and, and explore areas of the metaverse. Um, I think the uh, areas where technologists traditionally have real strength is the idea of the automation of various different processes, you know, bringing real efficiency uh, to to processes. And that's clearly an area, whether it's, I don't want to say just, whether it's sort of agile approaches to management and, and project management, which again, have historically come out of the software industry, but or whether it's actually the underlying technology that makes your job, uh, you know, developing and creating uh, campaigns more efficient and measuring and monitoring and all that. Those are these very important areas of, of partnership and, and relationship. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's probably a very interesting question worth actually having a discussion with a couple of CIOs and CMOs in the same mm -hmm, room. Mm -hmm. You know, who who's really on first these days, you know, uh, because I think a lot of the innovation, certainly, if, if you look at some of the big companies, um, whether it's Adobe or IBM or Salesforce, clearly, you know, they're 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 marketing directly to marketers, you know, to even to creative people. That's they're trying to detail and position their products uh, to those people who are making the choices, you know, um, and 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 perhaps even have the budget. And that's a shift, I would imagine, you know, from a time in which presumably most 
all of or everything came through the CIO. Today, I think a lot more of the influence over the spending and the vendor choices is probably coming from some of the functional areas like marketing. That's super interesting. Yeah, I, you you give me a good. That's a good idea for a roundtable we could do. With, you know, have a, have yeah. have a good a discussion. We have another one of our other top shows is one that's focused on CIOs and CTOs. That's called IT Visionary. Yeah. So. Um, we could we could definitely pull on some really interesting. It, it would also be interesting to get, you know, a CMO and a CIO from different industries, you know, to connect as yeah, well. Yeah. Both the maybe one a pair that work together and a pair that don't, and just see what that could bring. That's a really great idea. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for that. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, you, you also mentioned this idea of you know, and, I, and I've been hearing this as well. A lot of brands looking to display this sense of purpose and meaning and uh, you know mm. there's a mission that they want to get behind because to your point people are looking for this they're looking for this across all industries and they're making strong votes and choosing brands oftentimes based on hey well what's behind this thing what's behind the thing that I'm you know so how my, my question is just more i guess broadly speaking is like how can brands they a lot of them know this is important now but how can they really like plant a, a flag in the ground around this versus, oh, let's just spin out some cool campaign or PR around this cool mission? Like how, cause some of these brands are massive and huge. And so how do they mm. yeah, at scale plant a stake in the ground and say, this is what we represent. This is, you know, what we're about. This is where your, you know, your, your money's actually going. This is the stuff we're supporting, right? Like, yep. yeah, just would love your thoughts on that. Well, I think the first thing I'd say, and I always find these discussions fascinating, is the word purpose is, uh, I think, poorly understood, yes? Or at least what I would say is it's used in many different contexts. Uh, if you go back to the work of Jim Stengel and his book, Grow, you know, I, I think at that point, his sense of, of, of purpose was sort of a, a reason for the business to exist, yes? It was... Uh, you know the essence of the business. What are we in business to do? You know, and 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 I think his argument, and he demonstrated very well with data later that you know there was a high correlation between people who had uh, that kinds of focus around what they were in business to do uh, and and success, financial success. The word purpose, I think, today is a bit more broadly used to really mean what is your social purpose you know like uh, you know what is what political or social responsibility do you uh, represent through the brand or support you know and i think the two are not the same you know they they can be aligned but i do i do think it's worthwhile you know for marketers to think clearly uh, about that yes yeah? so um so what we know is you know, having a purpose, a, a very well, you know, well-defined uh, sense of why you're in business is, is going to will lead to all sorts of other very positive outcomes in terms of the alignment of functions, decision making, you know, how you present yourself in the world. But what we also know is that consumers are increasingly looking to brands to have a point of view or to evince a point of view uh, about some of these important issues. In fact, we've got some research we'll probably re release a little bit later in the summer, which demonstrates that for some brands, that's actually more important to consumers and alignment with their values than the functional benefits of the brand. Yes, that, that, that's now got to that stage. And there's some other work I've seen that would su suggest similarly. Um, and I don't think that's all woke washing and I don't think it's all virtue signaling. You know, there's clearly some kind of shift that's that's happened about how consumers are evaluating it but what we also know to your question jeremy is that you know brands have to do that in again buzzword but in ways that are authentic in ways that are aligned clearly with the business that they're in you know um and and this is why i thought for example it's a much talked about case but when cvs dropped the sales of cigarettes from you know the CVS stores, it was a hundred percent aligned with the fact they were repositioning themselves as a health company, you know, and, and then later with the merger with Aetna, et cetera. But uh, you know, a very challenging thing to do if you're selling cigarettes which are known to cause cancer. Um, but they gave up two billion dollars of revenue to do that. Now, that's a very powerful statement to consumers that you mean business. And I think you know, picking the the picking the the initiatives that are authentically aligned with the business that you're in 
uh, I'd argue, and this is where our research ha may, may help people, uh, aligning those clearly with the values of your target customers would be important too. And the third is to make really, is, is actions not words, I guess that's probably the simplest way to say it. You know, if people want to see, you know, uh, that, you know, you, you actions and consistent, let's say consistent actions uh, and, and big companies have greater challenges because they have multiple brands and multiple, you know, opportunities sort of to, um, to screw up. Maybe, you know, uh, we've seen that with, with one brand, uh, you know, seeming to take a position that's counter to another within the same house of brands. But, but I think what consumers want to see is authentic, consistent action. Yes. Mm -hmm. then they'll believe you. We've seen a lot of large brands in, in recent history, like Johnson & Johnson, Uber, Taco Bell. They all recently decided to do away with this chief marketing officer position, right? And they replaced them with roles like chief growth officer or chief experience officer or chief commercial officer, chief brand officer, et cetera. It seems to be this kind of shift in the CMO role. Like, should we be saying goodbye to the CMO role in 2022 and beyond? Like, what's happening and what do you observe there? Yeah, what's the famous Mark Twain thing about reports of my death are, uh, you know, over overestimated or something like that, you know, um, or at least premature. Um, yeah, greatly exaggerated, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Great exaggerated, there yeah. we go. Reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. A couple of things, one is that question actually is one of the central driving questions for this new executive master's degree that we we've start we're starting you know it's actually that question in a way that started to animate us all to think about uh what what is the role what's the emerging role of the cmo and chief communications officer you know perhaps even you know revenue generation how do all those things develop over time so one of the things we know that's critical and i and i think i'll answer your question but you know sort of I, i'll get there in pieces one of the things i think we know is critical is that there needs to be or there there's some perception that the marketing teams have not been as closely aligned to the growth objectives that the CEO and CE, CFO, for example, might articulate, you know, as as the real drivers of the business, you could argue that that's not because that was never marketing's role. I would argue it's always been marketing's role. You know, to build. I think uh, Tony Lucio talks about, you know, sort of building sustainable brands that will last, you know, that will last a lifetime and grow, you know, his, his focus has always been, for example, on growth, but it's the focus is marketers building sustainable brands that will lead to that kind of business growth. But so you could, you could argue that it's always been the focus, but there are some that have said that two, the two things I've heard are one, that there was a distraction with digital, which is fascinating in a sense because, you know, digital was perhaps the most measurable uh, of all of the marketing efforts to date, but that there, they were very strong perhaps in terms of performance marketing, but, you know, didn't do very much uh, broadly to grow the brand or they took mar marketers themselves weren't necessarily focused on, uh, you know, how does this become transformative to the business and, and actually create uh, new business models, new business opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one argument. And I'm not really putting my finger on either scale here. And the other, I think, is an argument which is perhaps a little easier to to accept is that marketing, whether it liked it or not, was always historically seen as sort of the creative people, you know, the folks who, at the end of the day, tell wonderful stories, create wonderful advertising. Again, that's not what we teach at NYU. You know, it's, we, we, indeed, the degree is an integrated marketing degree. It's, it's, we, we all know that it's the four Ps and more. But, you know, there was a sense, I think, in some companies that the marketers uh, you know, didn't quite have a seat at the table because what they did was sort of the, the the nice stuff at the end or the pretty stuff at the end. And again, I go back to the sort of Keith Weed idea of, you know, bringing the outside in and the future forward. You know, there's always been a role for chief marketing. The, the third thing I think, which I think is a very legitimate argument, and I can understand why, you know, C-suites or boards get to this place, is that in a similar way, when we talked about, you know, uh, integration of marketing and PR, the, the touch points, you know, to consumers that will then lead to positive engagement, positive, you know, profitable revenue, long term, uh, you know, uh, relationship building, all of that are, are mediated through so many different things, through customer service, through sales, through through marketing, through social media, etc. that 
you could understand the desire of uh, a CEO to say, look, we've got to coordinate all of that. You know, we've got to bring that together. Someone needs to orchestrate that. Someone needs to think that through more holistically. And, and, and that someone should have a sort of very clear eye at the end of the day on growth. You know, and so I think that's that's what has started to happen where you see collapsing, you know, first you saw collapsing of CMO and CCOs that was more around the communications function. Then you saw, you know, collapsing of, uh, of revenue and, and marketing or sales and marketing. Uh, and then you sometimes see sort of strategy revenue marketing all kind of coming together. And so you've got this idea that, you know, back to this notion of business transformation, if, if someone's really going to have these powerful levers at their disposal, like marketing and PR and sales forces, they need to be thinking about that in a more coordinated um, way. So that, that's my sense of where it's coming from. I don't think we'll see the death of CMOs. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a resurgence in many sense uh, of, of, of re-examining the important role of marketing in all of that equation and, and ensuring, at least again, back to the executive ma masters, our belief is any CMO or CCO or, you know, in, an emerging one of those should have those skill sets, whether they're called the chief growth officer or not. They, that should be in their faculties, their way of perceiving the world, the way of managing should include those, that orientation. It's not, it's not separate from, mm. from marketing. So. Something that you're, you're speaking of that reminds me of a, a conversation I had with uh, Jawad Bisbis, who's the global VP of marketing at the Ball Corporation, uh, ball.com, really cool, cool brand, up to some interesting things. And, he talked about, you know, a, a lot of his time is also, you know, just kind of petitioning to the, you know, to the board of directors, to other stakeholders of like, you know, changing the narrative around seeing marketing as this cost center or as this pure creative play. It's like he's really kind of, you know, in some ways, yeah, like having to use a lot of time and energy, like saying, no, the, the marketing brings much more than what it used to bring, right? And to change the narrative amongst the stakeholders and the boards, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of observations about that. One, one is there's there's some work which you know you may or may not be familiar with. There's a wonderful prof at Northwestern called Mohan Biasorni, and and he wrote an article on it. Yeah, you know, it's got to be 10, 15 years old, but uh, or more so even because I remember when I was at Time Warner you, using it as a very important sort of touchstone for me and he described what he called it's probably hard to describe uh, verbally but he described these what he called three horizons of marketing and and basically it was this idea that um you know the impact of marketing will will or marketing will have impact across these three horizons so the the, the first sort of tier was this idea of demand generation yes you know the basic job of marketing quote unquote is to generate demand or you know or, or, or generate qualified leads that convert into sales etc uh, and and it has revenue you know as, as a measure the second he talked about was this idea of building brands you know so you, to the extent that you are working on building a brand and brand relationships and and you're, you're building you're building something that has more or enduring value as as an asset but the the third category, which if I remember the chart well, he called thought leadership or uh, the idea of building entirely new capabilities or building into new business arenas and you know new business models. That was also a part of the marketer's role. And I think perhaps what we're looking at here is um, some of those higher order sort of horizons got lost a little bit and and. CMOs, you know, while they've always been in a position and should have always been in a position where they can have that conversation or, or, or not just conversation, but, you know, be having active impact, mm. perhaps they lost that or, the, you know, and, and there are some thoughts about why that might have happened in some of the emerging technology companies, which are much more, you know, about this product is insanely great, you know, and they're more product led than they are say marketing or brand led but but um you know so some thoughts about why that might have happened but uh there's no reason that marketing leaders uh there's nothing definitional about what we do as marketing leaders that says we can't inhabit those you know roles where we're actually providing um you know counsel and driving initiatives to explore whole new businesses mm. what, one related thought because i think it you know i don't want to go too far into the metaverse unless you do but but um one of the interesting things uh, Todd uh, Kaplan said, so he's the CMO of Pepsi, and he was, uh, we listened to what he had to say at one of the panels at Cannes, and uh, he made a statement, you know, which is interesting to pass out. He said, you know, 
potentially Pepsi is more than a product. It's a brand. Well, clearly it's a brand already. I don't think he, he didn't mean that. But what he meant was maybe Pepsi, Pepsi in the future is a music business or an entertainment business, you know, that, that the metaverse is allowing them, for example, to explore some of those things. And I think that's the sort of, if, if the CMO is at the C-suite board level, having those conversations, leading those conversations, I think that's what the aspiration is, you know, to, to, to in fact, one of the themes of can was uh, business transformation. I think that's the aspiration that marketers, you know, uh, have and, and want to recapture. Is the draw for the can festival for CMOs is the draw just let's go look at the, all the creative, let's get some ideas. Like what's the, why the big pull to all these marketing leaders to go to cans? Well, you know, I, th I think it's a couple of things I was on this morning with uh, Shane Millington and Sean Bryan, who the, you know, chief creative officers, uh, one North America, one New York for, for McCann. And, you know, what they said, at least from the creative and the agency perspective, I thought it was an interesting observation. One was that, you know, there aren't really many forums where the work of creatives are themselves marketed and showcased, you know, or, you know, that that's not their, their daily job is not to say, look at me, look at my marketing. It's just to do the marketing and the advertising. So, so one, you know, one reason I think is it's an opportunity for very creative, talented people to, you know, share their work and, and by, uh, you know, by its recognition, et cetera, obviously their agencies win business or impress potential clients. And another obviously is to learn. And I think that's one of the, you know, really amazing things about CAN. Uh, it's why we're going to take a group of students there next year as well, is is that it's it's sort of almost designed inherently for learning. You know, in fact, the CAN line, Young Lions and the various, the Roger Hatchell Academy, and there's lots of elements to CAN that already have that formally, but it really is a place where you go to learn from each other. It's uh, not not very proprietary, it seems to me. So I think I think smart marketers go there to, to learn from each other and see what's going on. Um, it's also a place where you have that, it's because it's such a global environment that you have that opportunity we spoke about earlier to, to see examples from all around the world and to you know, just approach problems from different vantage points and, and different, you know, understand aspects of different marketing challenges. And, you know, it's a just a very good, I think, um, marketplace of ideas. You know, um, the, the funniest thing I heard, though, uh, I think it was David Droger who said, maybe David Droger, he said, uh, the problem with CAN is there are a lot of tour guides talking about what other people are doing, you know, and, you know, I have to say, I didn't mind that myself, you know, I was actually okay, listening to some of those tour guides, or I kept a blog, so I was a tour guide myself. But I think I, I think his point is, you know, there are there, there are folks doing the work, and then there are a lot of people talking about the work. So, you know, curating that experience is probably a challenge. Okay. Uh, um, but it'd be interesting to see what happens with can, you know, it's obviously an expensive thing these days to send you know, 25 of your people, right. 50 of your people right. out, out, you know, it'd be interesting to see what happens. But. Well, it sounds like I'll need to make a, a an appointment to see you there next year because uh, it keeps it yes. keeps coming up in conversation. I'm like, okay, we're just going to go next year and, yep. and do and do something. So um, cool. All right. Well, let's get into a little bit of your background. Um, and I think, you know, what makes you an interesting marketing leader is that you've got such you know deep experience in academia and in the real corporate world. Uh, and so I uh, just, yeah. So I guess what I'm curious of is just like, where did this start for you? Like, what were these early creative sparks around marketing that led you mm. on this really cool career path? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, th I think I've said in the past, you know, I didn't wake up, you know, one day and say, I want to be a marketer. Certainly as a young boy in, uh, you know, Northeast London, uh, I didn't, uh, you know, that wasn't my uh, orientation in life. My father was an entrepreneur and I, I certainly found the work he did interesting in terms of building a business and he was trained as an electronic engineer. But but if if the truth be known, I was kind of sort of almost like, that's the last thing in the world I want to do. You know, I, I want I was I studied uh, English as an undergrad at Oxford and I was I acted in plays and I directed plays and, you know, and I went on to Yale to study drama. So my career, you know, initially was was much more about you know, literature, culture, you know, but what I realized in the middle of all that, and this is probably the enduring thing, is a real love of language and 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 a, an appreciation of the power of language, uh, you know, to to convince, uh, to um, 
to have impact on our emotions. You know, the famous orator Cicero, the Sir Roman orator. I love, I love this quote. I probably use it way too much and definitely don't hope to sound pretentious. But he talked about the effect is in the affect. You know, so the effect that language uh, or what we have, and this is very true for marketing and advertising, works because it, it's, it, it impacts your affect, your emotions. You know, it's not just cognitive. It really is affect. And actually, Ogilvy in his book, um, you know, on advertising quotes, actually a much more uh, um, a, de- a detailed story from, from, from uh, Roman oratory about, you know, different kinds of oratory and, and what really works and what doesn't work. And, you know, so, so there's this very deep history around language and rhetoric which was part of what i studied you know and the theater obviously is a is a great crucible for for that poetry you know is famously described once as uh, what off was said but ne'er so well expressed i think um wordsworth said it or coleridge maybe i don't know but you know it's this whole idea i just loved that idea as a young man of of words and the power of words and and how to you know create stories and 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 drive change and things like that and and there was this sort of business thing humming. My first job was really in managing theatre companies and running theatre companies and raising money for theatre companies, and and I loved that work. But it's non-profit theatre, and I think at a certain point in my life, I thought, okay, I'd like to buy a house, have some children, you know, um, have a little bit in the bank. And so I ended up going to business school. At business school, I I studied more strategy and I studied marketing a bit more formally. And I had a chance to go into Booz Allen Hamilton. Booz Allen Hamilton then was, you know, uh, independent, very well respected, one of the you know leading strategy consulting companies. And I worked in their media and entertainment practice, both in New York and, well, first in London and then in New York. Um, and and I worked on all sorts of strategy issues. Sometimes they were marketing related, uh, but I enjoyed that work very much, and I enjoyed the sector, you know, sort of uh, media, entertainment, technology. And when Time Warner, Time Warner Inc. was looking to build out a strategy group, uh, I applied for and was hired as their first, I think, professional sort of strategy person. They they had a wonderful leader of the group who who'd come from an M and A background, but she was looking for somebody who had some formal uh, strategy training. So I joined that group and had an extraordinary twenty year career at Time Warner, almost twenty years, uh, where I worked in different areas. Most of them were around strategy business development, you know, uh, international investing, early days of digital, all these kind of things. And and that took me to Time Warner Cable, where I worked in different areas around competitive strategy and um, managing, you know, the PMO for a huge acquisition we did, and ultimately into the marketing function in, in the company, which was an area that I had always been really interested in and thought I could add a lot of value. And my sort of purchase or sort of entry point was more around research and insights and uh, marketing strategy and marketing planning. So that's kind of how I brought some of that more sort of analytic, um, you know, structured problem solving thinking that I'd got from Booz Allen and other places into my work as a marketer. But, you know, hopefully it's always, I've always hoped this to be true. I'd, I'd like to think about myself as I'm sort of a left brain, right brain, brain person because I also have the background and training in um, you know the, the theater and the arts and a deep appreciation for those things so and I think that's probably a good combination for for marketers uh, you know to sort of um, balance those things we we talk about this notion of human centered and data driven as being essential to marketing you know is they're not either ors there's too many either or conversations we have unfortunately they're not either ors in marketing you need to be human centered and data driven and the two are very complementary. That's good. So. Yeah, something that we talk about sometimes with some executives is this you know, and we read about it as well is this idea of the modern day marketer really kind of it seems like the the really great ones have this right left brain thing like they they're really yeah. great at playing in both of those areas. They might not be the most masterful creative or the most masterful yeah. data scientist, but they know those two things well enough to to lead at the helm of some some incredible brands. You yeah. know, where I think in the past you may not have had to ha- have such strengths in both of those areas. You might have just been really strong yeah. in one and done well. But in 2022, yeah. it seems like the left brain, right brain thing has to be at the forefront for a marketing leader. Are you finding that as well? 
A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, I, I had a, a wonderful young student in my office early days and she was trying to explain to me why she absolutely didn't need to study statistics. You know, no way, shape or form does she need to study statistics because she wanted to be a brand manager. And what I said is, you know, the modern brand manager has to understand statistics as well as anybody does. You know, they, they you know, you have to infuse your understanding uh, of, of consumer insights and competitive, you know, actions and behaviors and all of that, you know, all of the qualitative stuff has to be complemented by, you know, whether it's just the notion of measuring the impact of marketing or actually the insights that you can derive from some of this data. So, so I think, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine a situation where uh, a successful marketer, uh, you know, at a leadership level, I'm not a specialist, uh, but I, argue even a specialist probably needs it, but you, where you wouldn't have uh, the capacity to navigate between those two worlds. You know, people talk about it as the the math and magic of marketing or the poetry and plumbing of marketing. You know, whatever analogy you want to use, um, uh, there's clearly, you know, when you saw, when you see Droga 5 and Accenture get together, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, and I think um, it's probably uncomfortable. Um, you know, I would never consider myself a creative uh, you know, gifted creatively in, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the magical way, you know, really top-notch creatives can, can, and can conjure and, and create and, and generate this emotional attachment and bond, you know, that's just, to me, that's still like a magic, you know, um, but uh, I think you have to have an understanding and appreciation for it. You can't discount it. You can't, you know, you can't sublimate it or anything. And likewise, you know, creative uh, marketers need to understand uh, the mechanics, uh, certainly of the technology, and they need to understand uh, the value of data and, you know, especially as it translates through insights. Yeah, so. That's fantastic. All right. Are you ready to get into some fun uh, lightning round questions? Sure, 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 okay, sure. Okay, let's do it. So before I ask you the first question, I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of the show, Salesforce. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. So for marketers out there that are interested in learning more, head over to salesforce.com forward slash marketing. The first question of the lightning round is, what is the last time you tried something new? I, I think it would probably be a new food or something. I was just on a uh, an island off the coast of France. And I, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I ate something I'd never eaten before. So uh. Okay, okay. <laughs> what is a life lesson you learned the hard way? I think it's a lesson I'm still trying to learn. It's probably, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, a little bit of humility and, um, uh, you know, obviously a, a lot of passion and a lot of energy. And, you know, I think it's important to constantly remind yourself, you know, you got to, sometimes you got to back off a little bit and, uh, you know, just... Uh, uh, you know, how, learn how to chill, I guess. What are you reading about right now, learning about right now? I'm really interested uh, in sort of artificial intelligence, the metaverse, you know, trying to get up to speed, to be candid, on, on that. Um, and I'm also, frankly, just trying to pass my way through what's happening politically and where do we go next and how do we figure that out, you know, so trying to read anything I can that suggests, you know, this might be the way forward or how to understand what's going on, you know? Okay, now this question, I ask this question to a lot of our guests that come on, but this question I think is is really important for you based on your background and so I'm, I am curious what you would recommend here. If you could choose one book as a mandatory read for all high school students, which book would you choose? I don't know if there's one book I would, uh, read many books and be constantly reading, I think. I, you know, I, there's a wonderful phrase I learned at one point. They said, leaders are readers. And I think maybe that should be my answer, that uh, read as much as you can, leaders is there, are Is readers, there a book so. that you like go back to and like refer back to or like go back and access like things that you've noted or anything like that where you're like, like one that you keep on the bookshelf or that you reference yeah. more maybe than others? There's a very good book on strategy called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard uh, Rummelt. I go back to that quite a lot. You know, I think the work by Kahneman, you know, um, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow is, or Think Fast, Think Slow is, is, is phenomenal, you know, as a, as a primer for uh, behavioral economics or behavioral, you know, insights more generally. As a novel, uh, the book that 
impacted me, I, I, I know had an outsized impact on me was uh, the human stain. And that had a really outsized impact on me. I, um, and, and then I think, you know, without sounding pretentious, uh, you know, Shakespeare, I, I, I go back to Shakespeare, I read Shakespeare a lot. So, so the human stain is a novel by Philip Roth, uh, just to be clear about that. But, um, you know, I do read Shakespeare a lot. I, I think, um, you know, he satisfies that part of me uh, that, you know, I talked about at the beginning, that's just so fascinated about language. Uh, you, I don't know what the stats are, but, you know, Shakespeare created thousands of new words in the English language or, you know, certainly hundreds of new words that, you know, are still in the English language. And and just that artful combination of language and and the sort of pictures he painted, you know, with words, you know, that that I think is a source of inspiration, you know, is, is a place I definitely go back to quite mm, a lot. Yeah, I think over 1,700 words that are still used in English today. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Shakespeare. That, that, that is amazing. Yeah, it's amazing, yeah. What is something that you are betting on for the future? Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 an interesting question, and I think elsewhere you have a question sort of about trends and capabilities and uh -huh. things like this. I, what what I really believe, I and this is you know when I think about my life project, you know, I think it's about uh, enabling, enhancing human capacity to learn, to understand, you know, to make thoughtful decisions based on facts. And I'm betting that we that that will continue to be an important human faculty and we will find it again yes mm. you know that we will we will get to a point where uh discourse is more civil that people are taking the time to educate themselves about things etc and i think technology will help enable that i don't think technology is in opposition to it so i'm betting that the future will be um a more civil society uh you know built around evidence-based and fact-based decision-making enhanced by, you know, community through technology. You, you mentioned the metaverse and, and Web3, and, you know, we're seeing brands like Wendy's and Chipotle and a growing number of companies that are exploring this potential of virtual worlds. Uh, what do you make of this? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. You know, I, I think there, I think the thing that we all probably need to take a pause on is that none of us really quite know what it is, you know, or, or or we may each have our own definitions of it, but none of us can know with certainty what it will become, you know. And so you have a lot of prognosticators saying, you know, the metaverse is or, you know, do X, do Y. And I think we're all we all should be in more of a learning mode. But I think what is indisputable is it's going to have a big impact. You know, I've, I'm finding that very difficult uh, to deal with the folks who are complete naysayers. And, you know, if you if you take some combination of Web 3.0, NFTs, crypto, and the metaverse, you know, it, it, those things just cannot be ignored or dismissed, you know. Um, I myself am not a gamer, but it hasn't stopped the industry being, a, you know, bigger than the entertainment industry. You know, I mean, it, it would be facetious to say, for example, in a generational way, well, I, I, you know, I like personal conversations. I don't want to live in them. It's silly. You know, that's that sort of solipsism that's very bad in marketing. So, so it's clearly going to be a very important, uh, it's going to play an important role. And actually at NYU, we've started what we call the Metaverse Collective. Um, and we're looking very specifically uh, at uh, how to draw together a number of different disciplines and initiatives, uh, you know, to, so that we understand this better. Uh, you know, how do we teach about the metaverse? How do we teach in the metaverse? You know, what impact will it have on culture and society? And, and just a little point about NYUSBS is one of the things I'm always so excited about being there and working there is, you know, this is a school that has disciplines in, in, in culture and arts. It has disciplines in travel, disciplines in sports, disciplines in marketing, disciplines in HR, disciplines in uh, technology. You know, so we, we had this capacity all in an applied professional way to bring minds together around these things. And I, th I think that's what's probably needed, uh, along with some you know, partnerships between groups like ours and, and industry to sort of pass our way through this and experiment. You know, I, 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 uh, but I'm very... I, I am positive about the potential impact of the metaverse and certainly broader Web 3.0 technologies on uh, the redefinition of, of brands, the opportunity to create new business models, the opportunity to create new forms of community and, and, and connectedness between people. I, I, I think we'll see a lot, a lot of that going on. What is your favorite app on your phone? 
My favorite app right now actually is a is a is a boating app called Navion. Really? Okay. And I've just recently uh, I've I've been sailing these catamarans. Oh, nice. You know, small catamarans, beach catamarans for a while, uh, but just recently got into power boating. And um, I'm quite anxious about, you know, getting from A to B and C to D without hitting rocks and things like that. <laughs> so there's this app called Navionics, and it sort of tra uh, it traces your route. It's like a GPS, okay. I guess. It's like a GPS for, for, you're, for you're, so the I, you're the first one. You're the first one who's mentioned this app. So I got to write that one down. Okay. Um, what is, what's one skill that you believe everybody should have? The combination of, of, of high capacity thinking with uh, humility and calm, you know, so I, it's probably two skills or three skills, but this idea of balance, basically, I guess, probably, maybe that's another way of thinking about it. Uh, I'm not a great fan of complete definitives. You know, I think situations are rarely either or, they're more often mm -hmm. and, you know, so it's the combination of things, the duality of things, I think is kind of mm. interesting. And then if you could pick up a new skill, like effortlessly pick up a new skill in a moment, what would you pick up? Uh, that would be playing the guitar. Yeah, I, I have tried over 30 plus years to learn you know i i never got very far i would love i you know my dream would be you know the guy at the party or at the beach who's just playing fantastic tunes and uh you know and i don't i guess i'd have to learn to sing at the same time because i have a terrible singing voice but playing the guitar and singing would be the two okay all right and last question uh, what would you want to share with other chief marketing officers across the Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000? What message would you like to leave them? Well, you know, I, I think it would be that uh, at the NYU, at the School of Professional Studies, we're very engaged in all of the questions that uh, we, we've spent some time talking about today and, and think that we can be helpful directly to them in their roles as leaders, but also importantly to their talent and their emerging professionals. And through programs like this, a new executive masters we've launched, we have certificates in healthcare marketing and communications, we have programs in, uh, av you know, advertising insights and optimization, social media, you know, so there's lots of, we, I think we're doing really good applied professional work. And, 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 and I want people to uh, think about education differently. I guess that's that's that would be the other message. Is you know I think education's got a little bit of a bad rap, um, or academia certainly has. And and my perspective, and, and certainly what we're working hard at at the School of Professional Studies is is this applied professional education. You know, sort of relevant, impactful, purposeful, intentional work to prepare people in a thoughtful way, in a rigorous, intellectually rigorous way. Uh, for the workplace of the future. So well done. Well, Michael, this has been a truly, a truly exceptional conversation. Again, like your perspective in this space is very interesting. I know a lot of marketing leaders and up and coming marketing leaders will be tuning into this. So such an honor to have you on the show. Let's do it again next year. I'd love to yeah. stay connected. Yeah, let's do it. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce and the CMO Club. The CMO Club is a global community for senior marketing executives to come together, share ideas, and solve their toughest challenges in a collaborative and trusted environment with other marketing leaders. Salesforce and the CMO Club provide best-in-class programs, events, and a digital platform for marketing leaders to come together and be inspired like never before. Join our global community at thecmoclub.com.